Well, good evening and welcome. The University of Tennessee Non-Credit Programs and Great Smoky Mountains National Park are proud to present a monthly webinar series through the Smoky Mountain Field School. UT and the National Park Service have offered educational opportunities through the field school for the past 44 years to encourage the exploration yeah. and understanding of the Smokies culture, history, and living creatures. My name is Darren DeVault. I am the Director of Non-Credit Programs at the University of Tennessee, and I will be your host and moderator this evening. Tonight's program is titled All About Bears and More, presented by Joel Zachary. All About Bears and More will focus on the natural diversity of our Great Smoky Mountains wow. National Park, and most uh, especially its black bears. Joel and his wife, Kathy, are the longest serving instructors in the Smoky Mountain Field School. Their vast experience with bears in the backcountry and their knowledge of black, black and brown bears spans more than 40 years with the field school. They also led small group backcountry excursions to Alaska's wilderness for more than 25 of those years. Joel Zachary is past board member and president of the Montana-based Great Bear Foundation, an international bear conservation organization, as well as our regional Appalachian Bear Rescue located in Townsend, Tennessee. Joel spent part of two summers in the mid-1990s on Kodiak Island, Alaska, assisting the village of Old Harbor with appropriate visitor bear interaction protocols. Black bears range from Georgia to Maine, and the Zacharys completed section hiking of the 2,175 miles of the Appalachian Trail in 2005. They are authors of Bears We've Met, short stories of close encounters. And I would like to say that I'm the proud owner of an autographed copy of that book. <laughs> so Joel and Kathy, glad to have you guys tonight. It's old home week. You guys are my longtime friends and I'm just delighted to, to have you on the program tonight. Thank you, Darren, and good evening. We're very pleased that you would choose to join us this afternoon and to learn a little bit more about bears and even more and before we begin, we do want to thank Darren and the University of Tennessee and the Smoky Mountain Field School, as well as Susan Sachs, who's education for Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And uh, as we begin, we would tell you that we didn't grow up around bears. We didn't really know much about them when we first started with the Smoky Mountain Field School. We weren't raised by wolves as well. But as we started with the field school in 1980 and 1982, or 1983 for Kathy, we had to learn about bears. We started taking people into the back country, more on backpacking excursions. And so we had to learn about this animal. And we'd say up front, we made many mistakes and then uh, learn from those and continue today to make mistakes. But it's always a learning experience with these animals. We also started doing Alaska trips in 1988 and thus had to learn about a different bear as well as my time spent on Kodiak Island with the Big Browns of Alaska. So we'd like to get started and uh, share a little bit with you about the bears. And so there's no greater place to talk about bears than Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And you may know that, that the Smokies is home to 1,600 black bears, about two per square mile of its 800 square miles, 552,000 acres. But that number has recently been updated a multi-state study has just found using hair DNA samples that we now have an estimated population of 1900. So that population is continuing to expand. When we think about the Smokies, it's certainly not the largest national park, St. Elias in Alaska with over 13 million acres is certainly the largest. It's not the oldest, Yellowstone National Park at 3.2 million acres, 1872 but it is the most visited national park and we continue to break our own records. The rangers in the park will tell us that they don't manage wildlife. Wildlife will take care of itself, but they have to manage people in keeping us doing the right things so we can enjoy these animals at safe distances. You may know too that we're the salamander capital of the world. And it said, if you put all of the salamanders on a scale on one side and all of the bears on another, that the salamanders would outweigh all the bear population. 
But you may not know that Jordan's red cheek salamander is found almost exclusively in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So it's certainly a treasure and one of many of this incredible habitat. If you visited many national parks, you know that you'll see a number of trees, a lot of vegetation, but in reality, you'll see 10 to 12 different kinds, different species of trees in most all of the national park properties. Great Smoky Mountains National Park has 100 species of trees alone. A greater diversity of plant life than all of Europe. So these trees are incredible sources of food, shelter, and certainly habitat for the bears, as we'll learn in this presentation. But that's not the end of the story about space. If we look north and south of Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we find Cherokee National Forest. It's Tennessee's only national forest managed, as you can see, by the Department of Agriculture under the U.S. Forest Service. Cherokee National Forest is 650,000 acres and it lies both at the northern border and the southern border, making about 1.2 million contiguous acres of wildlife habitat. It's all protected and home to these incredible creatures. When we learn about bears, we go back to childhood and many of us can remember stories about bears living in caves. We remember seeing stories where they came out of caves, they denned in caves, we heard the word hibernation. Well, two fallacies there. Bears don't make their home in caves and they don't hibernate. They go into a prolonged sleep, an easily aroused sleep that we call torpor. So is this a bear cave? No, but you may not know in the Smokies history, and this is an old, rather fuzzy photograph of one of the copper mines in the Smokies. And this is a very intriguing thing in that one of two of these mines brought out 80,000 pounds, eight, I'm sorry, 83 million pounds of copper in its day, over $10 million in value at the time. And within the whole national park system, one of these caves is second in terms of the depth found in all of the caves throughout these properties at 2,400 feet, and it had 23 sublevels. So that's a part of history that many people never know. You may know also that there are all sorts of tree deformities in nature. And this one to me looks a bit like a rabbit, but there's more to that story as well. There's been continual research and it's thought that going back as early as the 1700s, Native Americans would take small saplings and bend them to the ground at one end, if you will, at the nose of this rabbit to the left. And as that sapling grew, it would bend and eventually the thong would break and the tree would raise up being somewhat deformed as a spirit tree or trail marker. There are hundreds of these found throughout the country and are just now being documented to tell the story of the Native American travels. We all know deer, a white-tailed deer is a common inhabitant, particularly of Cades Cove in the park, and they're very good at camouflage. But would you notice this one? If you were out in nature, it may go unnoticed very easily. And I throw it up here just to prove the point that nature has its way of hiding itself. This particular fawn was just outside our door, just out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and the mother had dropped it just a few hours before we found it. It's about 10 feet from my hot tub, totally motionless, totally senseless, and we left it alone so that she could come and retrieve it late in the afternoon and take it back to the woodland. So what about this bear, this great animal that we see here? This bear is uh, typical of many that we see in terms of they're flat-footed, they, they walk plantigrade, we call it. That big brown muzzle is common. Notice that nose, it's all about the nose. Most of us would go to the dining room in a cafeteria or a hotel or resort lodge or own home, the kitchen. We would go with our eyes. The bear goes with that nose. It has an incredible sense of smell. The ears are perked in this picture. The hearing is probably as good as ours. The small dark eyes probably see as well as ours during the daytime and even better at night. So how is it that we have now 1900 black bears and that population is continuing to grow when there are more and more of us and less habitat? Well, we think it's more due to education 
teaching the public more how to coexist with these animals. That is taking in bird feeders when bears are present, securing cat and pet food, animal food when they come around. Learning more about how to deal with these animals as young children in public schools. Superintendent Cash here and former education chief Liz Dupree spent a whole day at the University of Tennessee a few years ago upon Cash's arrival to let these young people become junior naturalists. Also better law enforcement. There are severe penalties for taking wildlife out of season. And certainly there is no hunting in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. While there is hunting in the national forest, it's regulated by the state and federal governments. We have better law enforcement, better cooperation within state agencies, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency in Tennessee and North Carolina Fish and Game cooperate with the Park Service to ensure law enforcement in terms of violators. When people poach and take wildlife illegally, they're taking it from all of us because it belongs to the people of this country. We are shareholders in this wildlife treasure. Also, we've done a better job of enriching the habitat that is left. And here we see blackberry bam brambles after a prescribed burn in Cades Cove. We often think of burns and forest fires being detrimental, and certainly they are. But control burns are of great value in, in terms of enhancing food production for wildlife. Most of us will remember the tragic Chimneys 2 fire, November 23rd, 2016. But there is value to that. Sadly to say we lost human lives and property. But in terms of nature, nature recovers very well. We're seeing as a result of this, a resurgence of the Table Mountain Pine, a tree that lies dormant in seed form for many, many years until fire releases the seeds from these serotonous cones. Each little seed is wax coated and may lie dormant for 10 or 15 years until fire melts away the wax and the seeds germinate. This is an important tree to the Smokies and habitat for bird life and other animals as well. You may thought, walk through the woods and you see acorns on the ground. And acorns are a major source of food for all the big game animals. We think of the turkey, the deer, now the elk in the park as an introduced species, and certainly the black bear feeding upon these, particularly in the fall. Red acorns are in abundance a lot of times, but high in tannic acid. And so these animals prefer white oak acorns as their last food source in terms of winter coming along. If you look in the fall and you see a lot of acorns on the ground, you may think there's abundant food there, but pick up 10 acorns randomly and probably eight out of 10 will have small holes in them like you see here. And these are indicative of nematodes, roundworms, maggots, if you will, boring into the shells and consuming the meat, the nourishment inside. So just because we see a lot of acorns doesn't mean that there's a lot of food source there. So food can be hard to come by even when we have an abundant crop in the fall. And we call this mass. Hard mass in fall, over the spring and summer months, we have the soft mass, berries like huckleberries, blueberries, persimmons, and so forth. We have other competitors with the bear for these food sources. And I mentioned the elk as a reintroduced species. This has been an incredible reintroduced animal into the park over in the Cataloochee area on the northeastern end of the Smokies. The elk had been absent from the park for over 150 years, and it was decided by the Park Service after numerous studies to attempt to bring this magnificent animal back. This all started with the first release of 25 elk in 2000 and 27 more in 2001. And today this population has flourished and we have over 200 in the Cataloochee Valley, some venturing out even further. These magnificent bulls like you see here have switched somewhat from grazing animals to acorn feeding animals in the Smokies. They suddenly found a food source that they weren't used to and had, did not have an abundance of from whence they came. And so now we've noticed that the racks like you see here have increased in size as a result of this. You may go about the woods 
And you notice things like this, where you see a log that's been disturbed. If you look closer, you might even see claw marks or tooth marks. And you may think more than a small animal has visited this decaying food source. And often bears, even wild hogs, will prod through these remnants of dead trees looking for food. They're looking for ants, for salamanders, for termites, anything that's edible. And you may say, well, that would take a lot of termites. It would take a lot of termites or ants to fill the belly of a large bear. And that's true, but it's a constant feeding frenzy, particularly in the fall. You might miss sites like this if you're not paying attention. But oftentimes, if you go down a trail and you look ahead, you'll see logs and limbs that have been displaced. And oftentimes that's a result, again, of bears or wild hogs flipping them over, looking for whatever ever edible source might be there. They'll dig up yellow jacket nests in the fall looking for grubs. And apparently the pain is worth the endurance for the food source, the reward. So it's all about food. And so when people ask, where do people get in trouble with bears? We can talk about getting too close. We can talk about surprising the animal and a mother with her young, but not all bears have mothers, are mothers with young. And so I go back to the food source. It's almost always human food that causes disastrous interactions with bears. Most often the bear loses and very often humans become mauled and in rare cases become the victims of these animal attacks. So it's very important to secure food source no matter where we are, whether we're in the front country at a picnic area or the back country. And just as a point of reference, just beyond this sign, the first picnic table on the right in Cades Cove when this picture was taken had a full display, an elaborate display of a picnic lunch with no one in sight. Just fair fodder for a bear to come through. Bear-proof storage cans, trash cans are only as good as the maintenance by the departments that are responsible for picking up trash. And we as users that overcrowd them and don't close them properly. This trash can cost about $1,500 and is very much bear proof when used properly. But once when these animals become habituated to human food, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to change that. So when we travel in the back country, we see often signs at the beginning of trailheads and national forests and national parks. And signs like these, when there is a danger warning that says bears are active in the area, calls on us to be especially responsible. And actually it's better to even avoid these areas. This means that a bear or two has caused a problem because of human encounters, most likely food, a food source. And so it's, it's imperative that we're vigilant. Kathy and I in the back country, when we're stopping for lunch, or even cooking at dinner, always sit back to back where we can see all around us. We don't like surprises and they don't either. So when you see a bear out in the back country, it's an enormous sight, we all enjoy that. It's what makes us go. It's the symbol, it's the icon of nature. And we call it in biology, a landscape species that says a lot about whoever else can live there. But when you see one standing up like this particular bear, particularly if it's facing you, you may feel very threatened. The movies have conditioned us to believe this. But a bear standing up like this, in all likelihood, we're in the best position we could be in at the moment. And what this means is that bear has all senses forward and alert to whatever infringement that it has picked up. So its eyes are forward, the nose is out, those ears are perked. And all it wants to know is what's out there and what is the perceived threat. So when we do the right thing, we step back, wave our arms, look big, stay together, try not to intimidate the animal, but softly talk to it very quickly, almost always, it will identify us and scamper off in another direction. And that's the outcome that we want. Now you may know this animal, and you may not, and if you don't see it, perhaps you should stay home on the porch. But this is the Eastern Copperhead. And if you don't see the head, it's off to the right there. And Kathy and I saw this when we were about three or four feet away in the park. And I throw it up here as an example of how well camouflaged nature can make itself. 
So this animal puts a lot of fear in the minds of many people. And yet, if you look at the literature of Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there has never been a human fatality caused by a venomous snake bite. The park was established in 1934, but in 1931, the literature shares with us that a person died from a venomous animal attack. I leave that to you to ponder. Now here we see an, an over-digitized picture of our cat, Mozzie, and we've all taken pictures like this where we see the flash in an animal's eyes or those in that Christmas photograph of family together. So here a little better shot, you see our cat, Betty Crocker, by the way, and what we're seeing here is what we see in many animals, and particularly the bear, as a reflection of the light on the back of the retina. We don't have this ability. We get red-eyed effect when we actually see the vessels in the back of the eye, the blood vessels in some human photographs. But what we're seeing is the result of what's called a reflective tapetum. And this is a layer back there with the retina that basically allows in simple terms for light to be reflected twice. So bears see very well at night because in essence, they have a second look at us and any other thing that's out there. Now we all wanna see tracks and it's fun to see. Sometimes they can be very intimidating and it's often that we don't see them. When we're on trails hiking, so are other critters, sometimes horseback riders, and often many other hikers. And put quite frankly, bears don't leave much of a print, even in soft ground. But if you notice these tracks, they'll have five toe prints, and again, they walk plantigrade. To me, their back foot, their, I'm sorry, their footprint looks much like the back foot of the footprint of a human. And so I'm always looking for tracks. You see trail signs traveling through national forests, like over in Natahala here, and you see them in the park. And we're looking for directions. We're hoping we're not lost. We're wondering how much further we have to go, how much closer the shelter is or the backcountry site, but there's more to that information. Here we have an older sign. And I tell folks, they may not always get that great picture of a bear. Some don't want it. They don't want to be that close, but you see the sign that the bear has been there. So you can enjoy the animal without actually seeing it. So here again in that Hala National Forest, we see the evidence where bears have chewed and claws on an old signpost. Why do they do this? We don't know. Maybe it's curiosity. Maybe it's just out of boredom. But nonetheless, they leave that sign for us to know. You may walk along a trail and see it as a relatively inviting journey, as you see here without recognizing that it was a former railroad bed. Loggers in the late 1800s, early 1900s, put miles of narrow gauge rails throughout the park and the national forest, throughout all, a lot of the parks and national forest in the Southern Appalachians, ser searching for timber. It's estimated they took 2 billion board feet out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The Civilian Conservation Corps took advantage of these old railroad beds to make trails that we have today. Maybe not so appealing to a lot of people, but bear droppings have an interesting story in themselves. They tell us who is there and what they ate. And if we're attentive to this, we can learn a lot about the bear and its diet. Late in the fall, one of the last bright bloomers, if you will, the berries of the mountain ash can be seen against a blue horizon. And sometimes the droppings will be a bright pink or red indicating this last effort at soft mass before going into den size. If you look closer at other droppings like coyote droppings, you may see an assortment of hair and smaller bones. And here we find a mix of bear hair and hog hair in these coyote droppings. In my experience over the many years, most often in coyote droppings, I find bear and hog hair, which tells me they fed upon a dead bear, maybe a small cub, a piglet, or again, a dead hog. They're not going to take on adult animals. Too much competition there, risk of injury. I never pass up a decaying log where an animal might live, and I'm always cautious to approach these, but animals take advantage of where 
they can find shelter and protection from the weather, such as a dead and down log. Now, I have to admit, I've never had a pair of eyes looking back at me. I hope to this day to see them somewhat back in a log like this with an opportunity to bolt away if need be. But I always take advantage to look and often see where animals have scurried inside. Kathy stands here by Carolina silver bell, a beautiful tree with a gray chunky bark. And it's a wonderful tree to see up close, but looking higher up, bears spend a lot of time in trees. They're very adept at climbing. They have sharp, short claws, curved claws, and they make the trees their home. Bears are found as high as 120 feet up where they make their den sites in late fall. Usually the females will go into these sites early in December with the males following a little bit later, but not denning together. In the bear world, we say if they can get their head in an opening, they can probably squeeze the rest of their body in there. Wood is a very good insulator and bears will go in there in the den site in December, staying until late February, females arriving early in the spring with cubs, with showing no atrophy, no loss of body mass, and simply going into an easily aroused sleep. So, when you go about looking in the woods for various things, note that animals are very well camouflaged, such as the barred owl here, and pay attention to the surroundings. If you look at the data that's out there, three or more people that have hiked together have seldom, if ever, been charged or attacked by a black bear, grizzly, or big brown bear of Alaska. So there is safety in numbers. There is enjoyment in numbers. There are more eyes to take in and share these wonders of nature. As we wind down, I want to point out that animals are always wild. That never changes. That wild element never leaves. So no matter how tame, how confident, how comfortable that animal may seem around us, the wild element is always there. And that's the predictable, very predictable aspect of that animal, that it may display itself in a vicious manner at an unpredictable moment. And so we need to give them space and keep our distance. This last picture is one of my favorite. It's not a great sharp contrast picture. It's late in the evening, low light in Cades Cove, about a hundred yards away. But it's a massive bear looking back at people watching it, everyone doing the right thing, keeping their distance, the animal enjoying itself for a late evening and us enjoying this wonder of nature. So I close now and we'll invite questions and give you the opportunity to join in at will and we'll try to respond to those as best we can. Hey Joel, I'll lead off with a question. Okay, Darren. All right, uh, I know that there are two areas that are really popular for motorists, uh, the Roaring Fork Nature Trail over in Gatlinburg as well as Cades Cove over near Townsend, Tennessee and the Tremont area of the park. How would you rate those locations for motorists who want to enjoy nature but do it from the safety of their, their vehicle? That's a good question, Darren. I think both locations are, are wonderful places to see animals as well as bears. Interesting you would ask that question because I received a text today from a relative who took the trip to Cades Cove today and saw eight bears. Wow. All right, we'll open it up for any other questions. Uh, you can ask, it, unmute yourself and ask it live. Uh, or if you want to drop it in the chat, I'll be happy to, to read the question to Joel. Well, Joel, if you will, talk about your work with the Appalachian Bear Rescue. Well, Appalachian Bear Rescue is located in Townsend. And I say up front, it is not a visitor center or a welcome center, although they do have a welcome center in Townsend itself. But it's a wonderful organization with the mission of returning orphaned and injured bear cubs back to the park when they're located sometimes without a mother located after the mother has been killed on the highway, or maybe a young male bear who's undernourished and found by rangers with little hope of survival otherwise. I'm past president and board member and certainly continue to support the work of this organization. 
Okay. Are there any other, um, any, any popular bear stories or one that stands out from, from your uh, book? <laughs> no, but I will mention, because I think it's an important new find to share with everyone. We uh, have been trying to get back into the park more this new year. And I know everyone has been somewhat restrained because of the pandemic. But we started in January attempting to hike more and more. And we're doing a hike about every week. And we met a new friend over behind, if you will, Cades Cove. We were doing about a 10 mile hike. And this person had done uh, about 600 miles of trails in 2019. And this person commented to me that they saw during that period, 17 bears and 24 wild hogs. But what makes this interesting and a point to make is that the individual said they saw no bears while hiking with another person. So what does that tell us? Obviously, when we're by ourselves, there's less noise, less scent. And so certainly we have better opportunities, but there are risks involved with going alone. And so it's much better to maybe see fewer of the animals, but take along a friend. Okay. Hey, Joe, we have several questions now yes. in the chat room. I'll take them uh, in order. Uh, the first one was, when is the best time to see certain animals in Cades Cove, such as bears, foxes, and coyotes? Well, you have to remember that while we sleep, most all other animals are active, and particularly early morning, late evening, and we call this diurnal. And so oftentimes we don't see them because we're not out there at the right time. Now, having said that, with the weather changes in recent years, anything is on the table. You may see a black bear out in the middle of a large field and it's 105 degrees in the hot sun. So nothing surprises me anymore. But generally speaking, we'll have better luck early morning and late evening. Maybe not the best light for photography sometimes, but certainly we have that opportunity to capture the animal. Okay, and, and the second question was very similar to, to the question that you just answered. So I'll move on to the third question. What type of education do you need to work at the Appalachian Bear Rescue and, or even as a park ranger? Well, there are a number of volunteers particularly that work and, and are very dedicated to helping Appalachian Bear Rescue. And I would just suggest to go on their website or Facebook site and uh, inquire about that. There's information there that they always welcome individuals that are willing to help and save this magnificent animal. In terms of park rangers, there are basically three divisions within the park service. One obviously has to do with maintaining the roads, the highways, the facilities. Another is law enforcement, of course. We only have about 35 law enforcement rangers covering 800 square miles. And if you think about that, managing 12 million visitors a year, considering vacations and retirement and transfers, they do an incredible job of keeping the park safe and laws enforced. And then there's the, the division of education where people are interpretive rangers. And we also have an incredible volunteer group that work in the, in the uh, visitor centers, doing work on trails and just numerous other aspects of, of help for the national park. And so there are varying degrees of education required for some of these permanent positions. But again, it's best just to go for the current information with the National Park Service side. Okay, that was an excellent answer. Uh, next question is, what is the current status of building wildlife overpasses over Interstate 40 in Tennessee? Well, that's a timely question to me, especially. I've been writing for our Tennessee Conservation Magazine since 1967, not every year, of course, do the math on that, but uh, I am doing an article that is due August, in August and will come out a few months later in the Tennessee conservationists addressing this very issue. And there is a plan to develop overpasses along the interstate exchange, uh, overstate, interstate um, sections, especially through the gorge between Knoxville and Asheville, North Carolina, much modeled after those in, in the area of Banff in Canada. So there's real hope that we can make a corridor for safe passage for these animals that often get killed on the highway and also present risk to those of us as drivers. Okay, all right, we, uh, the questions keep um, coming in. So if, as long as you're willing, Joel, we'll sure, continue. Absolutely. Okay, 
the next question, if I'm hiking with a dog, what precautions should I take in bear country? Well, the first thing I would say is don't. <laughs> and you can't in the National Park, the Smokies. Dogs are great companions, but if we're going to hike where it's legal with a dog, it's mandatory to keep a dog on a leash. And the thought can be that a dog will perhaps in the, in the dog's world take off after a bear cub or, a, or an adult bear. And then when fright falls on, on the dog, it's gonna come right back to the owner bringing the bear. So it's not a good outcome. Dogs also sometimes get loose from owners and stress other animals. At this time of year, particularly expectant deer that are bearing probably two to three fawns and may cause them to actually give premature birth and lose those animals. And that's why they're outlawed in many areas like national parks. Okay, we've got two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the next question is, how close is too close for a bear to come to your area? We currently have a mom and three cubs on our property. And that question is from Eric in Dandridge. And Dandridge, as you know, is really close to the uh, National Park. Sure, sure. And I might mention here uh, quickly that recent studies show that our bears leave the park and leave greater distances than we've ever known before. And before GPS studies that have occurred at the University of Tennessee recently. And what we find is over 90% of the males leave the park at some point and venture back and forth, some at great distances, some linger out there for a time and come back to the same locations in the park. Over 40% of the females do the same. Now, the best way to answer this is to use what is the law within the park regarding the elk and the black bear, and that's to keep a distance of 50 yards. And if we think of a slow football game, that may seem like eternity, but to put that in perspective, at a full charge with a bear, and they can initiate that very quickly, that's 44 feet per second. So in three seconds, that bear can be in your face. Now add to that, the elk can move at 45 miles an hour. And so we are no match when those animals become stressed and perturbed with our presence. So the greater distance, the better. And usually around homes, where they may become more adaptive to us, just watching their signs of stress and backing off if their behavior change, might, changes may be safe enough and having a place to safely retreat. Okay, and Joel, our last question of the evening is, do older bears start having tooth decay or could that be a sign that the bear has been eating human food? Well, yes and yes. Um, Actually, the oldest bear documented in Yellowstone National Park, the data just came out, was 34 years old and had just a few nubs. And fortunately, the bear had made it that long. Unfortunately, it was not doing so well because of its age and the rangers decided for its best interest to euthanize it. But yes, our food does great harm to these animals. And the main way it does that is they become habituated to our food and they rarely go back to natural foods. Some people might say, well, why don't we just relocate them to another area of the national forest or national park? And that we have found over the many decades just simply does not work very well. They often beat the rangers back to the location really in two or three days or weeks. But you have to remember that every square inch of Great Smoky Mountains National Park in similar areas of bear habitat is claimed by another bear. So when you relocate one bear to another location, that property is already owned. And oftentimes the owner will kill that invading bear. So it's not helping the animal to relocate. It. All right, well, we had some really good questions. I wanna thank all the participants for, for uh, posting those. Uh, and we had a lot of people chime in on the chat room to thank you guys, to thank Joel thank and you. Kathy both for just and a terrific pleasure. presentation. It's been delightful and, and just a lot of fun tonight. Thank you very much, Darren, for having us and all of the guests that came in. And we hope you'll continue to enjoy this animal, keeping your distance and keeping them wild.